For this, our second Join the Summer Alumni UBC Summer Series podcast, put on your hiking boots or running shoes and let's go. The UBC Vancouver campus is located on the traditional ancestral and unceded territory of the Musqueam people, and the UBC Okanagan campus is located on the unceded territory of the Sayouts people. We're adventuring with geocaching experts and joining two relative newbie runners as they participate in a virtual race. Geocaching. Okay, some may be wondering what it is. Hmm, a silly question if you ask the many avid geocachers for whom it's nearly a lifestyle. My name is Jen Seva, and I work at Geocaching Headquarters. I am also an avid player of the game myself. My username is Miss Jen, and I've been playing the game since 2001. At Geocaching Headquarters, I'm the Business Development Senior Manager. So geocaching has been around for, oh, a little over two decades. So many people have heard of it. If you have not heard of it, what it is, is a scavenger hunt. In the real world, you look for hidden containers and you use an app and the app will show you the geocaches that are nearby. It shows you some information about them, like its name, its terrain rating, its difficulty. Difficulty would refer to, you know, do you have to solve the mathematical puzzle first? Or is it written in Dutch? Geocaching is very popular right now, and also it has endured in popularity over the decades because there's something about an old-fashioned scavenger hunt that pleases the human psyche. It is just something deep within our humanity that we like to look for things and be delighted by the surprise that we find when we get there. Hi, uh, my name is Matt LePage, and I graduated from UBC in 2000 with a PhD in chemistry, and then I taught at UBC for four years, and then I left in 2004, and I've been teaching chemistry at Capilano University ever since. So that's me in a nutshell, living in Burnaby, raising two boys. So completely unexpected, about eight years ago, my sister-in-law invited our family to a girl guide event in Surrey, and she said they were going to try something called geocaching, and there was an app that I should probably download. So I did that, and we went to this event, and the girl guides had set out about five geocaches that they'd hidden in, I think it was Redwood Park in South Surrey, and I just completely fell in love with it. So uh, I have staggering amounts of experience finding geocaches. I've found over 15,000 so far. I don't really care about the technology behind geocaching. Many of us have a base need to be hunter-gatherers, so I think it's striking at that fundamental need to hunt. It just gets me out into nature. Um, there are hundreds of hikes that I've now been on because of geocaching, and I've met so many great friends now because of geocaching. Here's a little story about how geocaching began. The first geocache was hidden in a town just outside of Portland, Oregon. The person who hid it was able to use his handheld GPS device to get latitude and longitude because just days before he hid it, then President Bill Clinton allowed the military satellites that are projecting information to GPS devices, they flipped a switch to allow civilian GPS devices to receive the signals to a pretty accurate degree. It used to be fuzzy on purpose for civilians. And then suddenly civilians could use this technology and somebody said, well, hey, we could play a game. Can you find this bucket that I hid out in the woods outside of Portland, Oregon? And someone did, and someone else said, I want to hide something. And someone found that. And pretty soon, a few more people are playing, and eventually more and more people are playing. And now here we are in 2021 with over 3 million geocaches hidden around the world. The alumni UBC Summer Series joined the geocaching craze. So the University of British Columbia is participating in our group program which means alumni and perhaps some staff may be 
participating together, creating geocaching accounts, finding geocaches, and being active in the game. Different points are earned depending on your activities in the game. And there's a leaderboard and you would be able to see the activities of other people participating, you know, in comparison to you. So hopefully there'll be a little bit of friendly competition. Is geocaching a competition with others or with yourself? Matt's perfectly positioned to answer that question. Right. The only tie-in that I'm aware of is something called the leaderboard. So the leaderboard exists on the app as a scoring system where anybody who's part of it is racking up their points. And UBC's Summer Series has their own leaderboard. So all of us who are UBC alumni, as we go about our geocaching days, not only are we getting the regular credit for finding a cache, but we're also getting points on the UBC leaderboard system. What's the incentive, right? Why did I sign up for this? <laughs> I just like competing with other people, but I have seen in the literature published for this that there will be prizes given out for, I don't know, the top three or whatsoever people on the leaderboard. So that's just a nice little bonus to add on. And so I've just pulled it up just now and it shows for me the top 20 people and next to each person's name it gives the current number of points that they have and it also lists which particular geocaches they found to accrue those points. Given that I am semi-addicted and that I am a teacher, which means I currently have the summer off, I am well ahead in the first place with approximately triple the points of second place. Oops, my bad. <laughs> The road to being an expert is paved by beginnings. You create a username and it shows you the geocaches that are nearby. You pick one that seems good and you try and find it. Take your eyes away from your phone screen and look around you and look for this hidden container. It could be very straightforward, such as a plastic weatherproof box. Or sometimes it's really, really unique and clever and crafty. Maybe that birdhouse is not really a birdhouse. Perhaps that potted plant is hmm, not really a potted plant. And it gets much more creative from there. A fake wad of chewing gum. Fake doggy do. Maybe a magnetic sign that you'd be staring right at, not realizing that you can peel that magnetic sign off the piece of metal. And there's your cash. They can be as tiny as a pencil eraser. They can be as large as something you can climb into and sleep. Probably my favorite type are what's known as gadget caches. So as the name implies, there's something extra that you're going to have to do to be able to somehow access the log sheet, the piece of paper that you need to sign to prove that you found it. Most common type is you're going to need to bring two liters of water with you because there's probably going to be a five or six foot tube and when you fill it with water, up floats to the surface a film canister with a log sheet. Matt needed a UV light, a laser pointer, and a flashlight for a newly published geocache in West Vancouver. So I met with another guy and we decided to try and be first to find. So we headed on down the trail and within about 10 minutes we'd found what's called stage one. And it was just a laminated card with absolutely nothing on it. But we realized that uh, when you shine a UV light on it, then the coordinates were shown in invisible UV ink. So it's like, okay, that's cool. So we typed those coordinates into our phones and hiked a couple hundred meters. And that got us to the next part where we realized we would need to use our flashlight because there's something called a fire tack. And it's essentially a special thumb tack that people very carefully place high up in trees and when they're hit by a beam of light, they just blaze. Quite often what the cash owner does is they'll set up a trail of fire tacks through the forest. And each tack is pretty much at the limit of your vision. So you can barely see the next one when you scan the woods with your flashlight. So we followed the trail of fire tacks for about five minutes. And then we finally came to a tree that had a few thumbtacks. And we realized that we had to put our laser pointer in this system of thumbtacks and press the button and the beam shot away and it hit a tree about 30 feet away near the base and so we're like okay 
and we went to that tree and sure enough at the base of the tree hidden behind a rock was the geocache. So that's a pretty amazing combination of technology. It took Matt and his friends about 10 minutes between each clue or stage. Altogether, an hour to find the cache. Once you successfully actually identify and find the geocache, what you do is you open it up, sign the logbook inside that says, I found it. And many people will write the date and their username. And perhaps there are items inside that you would like to look at. Trinkets, toys, a dollar bill maybe. Once I found a $20 bill. And the idea is if you like something, uh, you can take it. And because this game continues on after you find that cache, you would honor system, you would put something into the cache as kind of trade, but you'd leave the logbook, now it has your signature on it, and you'd close the container and put it back exactly the way that you found it. Geocaching comes in many forms, from beginner to advanced. There's cache and trash out, letterboxing, virtual caching, and geotours. If you can think of it, most likely some inventive mind has created it. There are about 20 different types of geocaches. I typically am very partial to the virtual. And with a virtual, it simply takes you to somewhere that's spectacular. But due to the nature of the area, you are not allowed to physically place a geocache. So it might be a national monument or an environmentally sensitive area. So you pretty much just take a selfie of yourself there and answer some questions online. And that's your proof that you were there. There are over 3 million geocaches around the world. So you can imagine there's a range of difficulties and terrains. They are all over the world. Some are even in Antarctica. Matt has made friends geocaching. His group increased over time to include friends with similar hiking, endurance, and enthusiasm levels. Myself and about seven other people, we try and get in three geo road trips every year. Typically we travel throughout BC, sometimes into Washington State, wherever there's a high density of geocaches. We like to go there for three or four days and just clean them all out. One of the things that is interesting about geocaching is that you can do it at home, you know, on your way to your daily errands, or you can do it while you're traveling. We have geo tours, as we call them, around the world, and they are themed collections of caches that help a person really get to know an area and you're using geocaches to guide your way, self-guided, around a city or a region, and of course you're earning points all along the way as you find each of these geocaches, and many of them are supported by the local tourism organization. So it's a really fun way to travel. There are two examples that I wanted to share here. One is in British Columbia. We have the Gold Country Geo Tour, which has 147 geocaches all around the Gold Country region and you're learning about the small towns and the history and you're going on some amazing hikes to find these geocaches. Another geotour we have is located in Italy. It's called the Ten Castella Geotour and using geocaches again, you're exploring 10 medieval castles in Tuscany. How amazing does that sound? once we can travel to Italy. I think the reason that I love geocaching now is that it's brought two main things into my life. Number one, exposure to seeing so much of British Columbia, all sorts of places I wouldn't normally have gone to, but it's lured me out. And number two is that I have met so many spectacular people who are now my best friends. I would never have met these people otherwise. One of my favorite things about geocaching is that it is both an activity that I do by myself and while I'm doing that, I'm actually in community with a whole world of people. So I could be looking for a geocache on a hike in a forest by myself and I know that someone placed that geocache there for me to find. So there's another person sort of 
playing with me, although they're not there. And there are many people who have come before me who have found that geocache and lots of people who are going to find this geocache after I find it. And extending that out into the world, and because I've been playing the game for so long, I know people around the world, literally just because of this game, I have become friends with some of these people. Community and adventure are the best qualities of geocaching, not unsimilar to those of a virtual race. As long as it's forward movement, running, biking, walking, swimming, or skating, the goal of the alumni UBC race is to get from point A to point B, or the Vancouver campus to the Okanagan campus, about 400 kilometers. Joy in the summer? Actually, yes. My name is Vicky Tran, and I work for Alumni UBC. I recently started an inaugural position that I'm super excited about, which is digital editor for Trek Magazine, the official alumni UBC publication. I wrote an article called The Life-Changing Magic of Exercising Daily, and really the tagline is the truth, which is, you know, how I outwitted inertia, the gravitational pull of my bed in the mornings and learn to, you know, sort of like working out. I'm, I'm on a much better relationship with working out right now than I was definitely a month ago. I had read this book by an author named Gretchen Rubin called The Four Tendencies, or rather Gretchen Rubin read it to me because it was an audio book. And it was very revealing, you know, where she talks about, you know, there's lots of different ways that you can slice and dice and analyze personalities, kind of divide people up into four categories based on how they respond to one question, which is, how do you handle expectations, both from other people and your own expectations for yourself. There were the unicorns, those who are able to meet external expectations, but also their own internal expectations. Mm -hmm. You know, write a book, exercise every day. And she calls them upholders. And I absolutely cannot relate to these people. <laughs> <laughs> and then the second category was those who are really good at meeting people's external expectations and then are really bad at meeting their own because it's a far easier to let yourself down than it is to let other people down. And those she calls the obligers. And I fall squarely in that group. It helped me understand why I could work long hours on a volunteer report I'm doing for an organization, but not be able to finish one short story. I had wanted to have a regular exercise habit. It was sparked by taking a course on habits offered by Alumni UBC. I kind of grudgingly signed up for it. Like I knew it would be good for me. And I knew that as a student, I would follow everything the instructor says, but I was also <laughs> like, oh, I know this about myself. What am I signing up for? Um, but I absolutely 100% am so glad I did because literally the next day when the instructor said, start on your habit. And my habit was to just run to actually work out in the morning. So whether it was a run or if it was raining to do like an indoor quick 10 minute workout on my fitness app, but to do it first thing in the morning because I've learned you know, over the past many years that that is what energizes me for the day. And so literally the next day, the day after the first class, I was out there running and I ran every day of the five weeks and I only missed one day. The course ended around June 9th, and I was like, ooh, I don't want to lose this momentum. My name's Olivia. I am going into my fourth year now at UBC. I study art history and psychology. I actually started working in the Robert H. Lee Alumni Center in my first year at the Welcome Center, as well as doing some events representing the building. So I've been a part of the alumni UBC community for my whole degree, which is interesting, even though I'm still a student. Honestly, I haven't been the most active runner. I, uh, for the longest time, I was playing soccer and basketball. So that's how I would get my steps in, which I really enjoyed because you run a bunch, but at least for me, it doesn't feel like you're running a whole lot. But since the pandemic, obviously I haven't been able to play team sports, so I started just running on my own. I found that quite enjoyable. It's quite different. I find it harder, at least mentally, to just go for a run. So I've been running for maybe a year and a bit now. But I've never done a virtual race before, but when I was reading about it, I thought it would be good motivation and 
uh, it just seemed interesting. I wanted to learn more. So then the virtual race was beginning on June 14th. It's just a couple days after the course had ended. And I said, you know what? I'm going to sign up for it, even though it's a bit of a grudging <laughs> sign up, because I knew it would give me that structure. And then also just to raise the stakes a little bit, I decided to ask my sister, who has run, you know, half marathons, who has run 30Ks, to do this with me and, you know, have some sort of stakes involved where the the loser would treat the other to like a really fancy nice dinner out and i fully am the underdog in this scenario in vicky's course she learned about accountability buddies i would say that my sister is my accountability buddy in the sense i call it sibling accountability slash rivalry you can use sibling rivalry to help you as well (laughs) accountability comes in another form Alumni UBC provides a virtual race tracking platform. Olivia connected to it on her health app on her phone. It'll grab um, your daily steps, uh, as well as if you like go for a bike ride. It'll track all of that, and that goes towards the virtual run. So not only is it the amount you are actually running, but it's walking, biking, swimming, all that stuff. And on the app, it's like mapped out the distance between the two campuses. A virtual race is a kind of stay-in-the-neighborhood event. Vicky's neighborhood is North Burnaby. It is really quite hilly. It's hilly country, I like to say. Where I live is actually in the middle of a really steep hill, but there's lots of trees all around me. It's a bit of a winding path that goes up. When I get to the top, I feel like the king of the world, even though I'm a hot and gasping mess. Um, And then I will find all the little nooks and crannies that have trees. So there's like a nice little park nearby that has these really tall trees and a trail that is very short. There is a playground nearby. There is this lovely stretch of an alley that borders a playground where the neighbor has taken the trouble to plant this strip of lawn that runs alongside the school fence. Maybe for 300 meters, you feel like you're in a wooded, peaceful, serene forest. Olivia lives in North Vancouver. I'm blessed to live right next to a park. So I will run from my house and do a lap or two of the park. And it's nice because it's... um. It has a trail that goes around as well as like a concrete sidewalk that goes around. So you can kind of do a lap in the trail and then I'll do a lap on the flat surface and then a lap on the trail and then come back home. Alumni and other virtual racers track each other's progress from Vancouver to Surrey, Abbotsford, Pitt Meadows, Coquitlam Summit, Merritt to Kelowna and their final destination. I just crossed the bridge into Pitt Meadows. I think Olivia at this point today, she's in Maple Ridge. I can see her. But I just crossed the bridge from Coquitlam and I'm getting close to, you know, Pitt Metals Regional Airport. And I think it's amazing to think to myself that I have run the distance from UBC to Pitt Meadows. Like that just blows my mind. I think yesterday I was in Pitt Meadows. <laughs> it's really cool to see sort of everyone's progress. I'm actually in Golden Ears Provincial Park right now. I just pulled it up. Once you reach a certain distance, it'll send you a little write-up about where you are. So it'll be like, hey, you're in Golden Ears National Park. Here's what that looks like and some fun facts about it and stuff. So it's really cool. And I really like looking at the distance and where you are in BC. And you kind of get to explore it, even though I'm just running around my neighborhood. One person, his, his name's Todd, who's in the race, and he seems to do a lot of biking. And so I'm definitely, like, noting how much he's doing and, like, okay, like, I got to pick up my pace a little bit, maybe. <laughs> I actually don't know Todd, so if he's listening to this, he's going to be very, um, <laughs> he's going to appreciate the shout out. There's a biker in the group who, at this point in the game, is already, let me just bring up the total He has already completed 85% of the race, 372 kilometers almost, and we are on day, like, eight. Todd is setting the pace, but so too is Vicky's sister, at least for her. I have an internal deadline in that I have to get to the end before my sister does. 
she is actually around Maple Ridge. So I like close the gap a bit. She was at 1.30 kilometers ahead of me. So I'm like inching up. When I tell people I run every day, I think they have in their minds that I'm running like a lot. And really, if I if I do two to three kilometers, I'm really happy. And my goal is to like get to five kilometers in like the next week or so. But that's it. It's really like amazing how just doing a little bit adds up over time. And even like a 15 minute run leaves me feeling so uplifted for the entire day. Like Matt and Jen, Vicky has found a community. I've gotten to actually meet a lot of the regular dog walkers, which has been a really nice side benefit of going running at a regular time every morning. You start to meet your neighbors and you start to feel a little bit more connected to your community as well. Whichever sister wins, whoever is second to Todd, participating in a virtual race is just plain old fun and healthy and inspiring. A summer joy, for sure. Alumni UBC is your alumni association, connecting alumni to the university and to each other. You can take advantage of perks and benefits, attend a career development event, or sign up to volunteer for a cause that makes a difference in your community. We also have contests, a travel club, and social events around the world. Download the Alumni UBC app or visit alumni.ubc.ca to learn more.